Рад начать нашу панель. I'd like to start off our panel. Несмотря на то, что первоначально у нас здесь не было анонсировано в подробных вопросах, что будем говорить про денежную кредитную политику. Yeah, we didn't initially announce that we want to talk about monetary policy, but we have to have to say something about it. And uh, every person has an opinion on monetary policy, like about football and the latest uh, central bank decisions to raise uh, the policy rate by uh, three quarters of a percentage point uh, uh, actually caused an uproar. If you look at uh, some of the media figures, many say, come on, it's a complete shock. The central bank has gone bonkers. Instead of trying to calm the situation down, it's uh, boosting inflation without, instead of trying to calm it down. And some applause the central bank saying it uh, was proactive, and the data really proved that was the way forward. Alexander, can you comment on this? That decision came last Friday. Is it due to a change of approach, maybe, because some have a feeling that whenever the central bank says it wants to go to the fine-tuning, it seems to be always surprising. Previously, this, the uh, expert community wanted to see a big increase, and we saw only a minor step. And now everyone waited for a small change, and now we're seeing, uh, in fact, a huge increase. So is it a change of paradigm? Are we getting ready for some inflationary scenario that was published in a report? Or are you staying true to the paradigm and it's just some unusual decision? What is it? What was it? Thank you, Sergei. That's a great question. Well, everyone's supposed to drink champagne and maybe you don't really care about the <laughs> central bank policy rate decision and uh, I hope that monetary policy will not spoil the mood in this audience. Well, it's the last chance to have champagne together before the lockdown and so we won't be able to have conferences like this for some time. Okay, you are right that the uh, assessment of uh, the market trends in, uh, in economic trends and inflation trends in September and the one in October is quite different. They really are different. So back in September, we wanted to fine-tune it slightly, to tweak it slightly. And in October, our assessment was uh, the risks were to the, to the downside. And it's not only because the prices, real prices, uh, in, were up significantly, and we see that it was mainly due to the fr fruit and vegetable price growth. Monetary policy cannot control it directly, and we don't respond to the pro higher prices for potatoes. But what we see is that this growth, this elevated, accelerated price growth, pushed forward inflationary expectations. And again, our inf inflation will be higher than uh, our target because of the low base effect. Uh, the inflationary expectations will not cool down as fast as we want them to be. So there will be some spillover effects that will you know, um, slow down the potential deflation or uh, slow down the pace of uh, deflation. So we really hope to get inflation around 4% next year. That's our target, as you know. So in terms of our priorities, we would be aiming for more resolute action in terms of monetary policy to make it on time, given the lags that you mentioned. And again, it, these lags could be up to five quarters so that we have enough space to you influence inflation through transmission mechanisms to have it 4% by the end of last year. And according to analysts, at low rate, 
4 to 4.5 percent, we would be able to make it. But our analysis, our research showed that no, lower rates would not be, help us to achieve a 4 percent inflation rate. Great, you talked about inflation expectations. Now, what they show is quite an interesting trend, based, by the way. On the one hand, market pros and researchers are quite positive to the actions by the central bank. The sooner you hike up the rates, the sooner inflation will go down. But there's a different position that we hear, the different voice, which is more rampant. Well, the central bank takes such action, then in reality the situation is that bad that inflation will only grow. And that drives in inflation expectations among the households, among the population, swings to the other side. So it actually feeds uh, inflation expectations. Do you see this effect? No, we don't see that effect. And a more detailed analysis that uh, we have done indicates that you do have the uh, stable component uh, behind uh, price growth, like a base inflation, not the, the one that's produced by the Russian Statistics Agency, but also excludes some of the components. We we'll also look at the median figure. So if you break it down, if you go really granular, then you see a different picture. The median for food and the median for, diff for, for services are different. The median for services is 4%, the median for food is higher. So food basically drives uh, inflation. So currently, the current growth in inflation is due to the growth in food prices. And those steady, those uh, stable components, uh, their price for them is quite high. And this is why we decided to respond in this way in terms of monetary policy. But there's no reason to panic. No expectations for any panic. OK, I'd like to ask uh, Alexander Isakov. Uh, Alexander, can you comment on this? At VTB, you work hard to follow the paradigm of the central bank. So you want to replicate the same actions at VTB. The central bank is fully transparent. They published all the research. And it means that the private sector, the researchers, should also come to the same conclusions, right? But what we see is contrary to, to that. Sometimes uh, analysts have a different view. And analysts uh, very often lose that uh, guessing game. Why is that? That's a great question. I think, OK, you said why researchers are lagging behind, why they can keep up, can't they keep up with the Bank of Russia projections. I agree that the communications by the Bank of Russia were fully on spot on. The uncertainty again indicated that uh, mo most of the experts uh, expected a uh, 25 basis points increase. Uh, but I think the analysts are only starting to learn what the central bank is doing, starting to understand the central bank. And the central bank's communications have helped us to accelerate this process. I don't know how they would have managed to do it without those uh, publications. I don't know how they would have managed to set the right expectations for the next two or three years. And everyone in the market has a full picture right now. You can, all the researchers can look at the trajectory for the path for the policy rate uh, and you know adjust accordingly. So I think we're moving the right direction. There are two points I'd like to raise right now. And it would be great to discuss them. Let's go back to 2018. 
That's normal, yeah. And we can do the benchmarking. All of the policy rate hikes that were not expected by the market led to a decrease of uh, long-term uh, rates. And that's really good. The central bank is really focused on inflation. This is why your long-term rates should be lower. Then, following the September and October sessions, the long-term rates usually go up. And I think we need to consider it seriously. We need to look at those patterns. Why do we wait not a sooner decrease of the rates, but why, are we, why do we expect a contrary decision? I hope we'll be able to figure out why it's happening, and I hope that the monetary policy report could come up uh, with some solution. And uh, it's usually published with a lag, and you might uh, you know, reflect on this. It's great that you mentioned uh, this, uh, Alexander. I think it's not a myth what you are saying. We see it with our own eyes that the latest policy rate decisions led to this phenomenon. Thank you. Sergei Pavel, can you comment on this briefly? Well, it's always like a rear view mirror explanation, a try like a post mortem of a kind. What I feel right now is that at the moment, here in Russia and elsewhere, global regulators are reassessing inflation, whether it's a temporary thing or not. Uh, it was a minority view that it was high impact view that it's a temporary thing. But right now, even though we understand that inflation is more of a supply shock related thing, it could be a mismatch temporary when demand for food is higher than demand for services. It might not reflect a um, permanent change in the economy, and that's why we have an extra burden on logistics. Up until recently, everyone thought that, OK, it's a temporary thing, you know. It's not going to last. But as I've been saying recently, the satellites show that logistics issues are getting worse, so it's not getting better. Whatever the reason behind it, people give up, and regulators give up on the previous uh, paradigm that it's a temporary thing. And my hypothesis, and again, it's a backward rationalization and a hindsight, that the longer part of the curve a response to the fact that the central bank no longer believes that inflation is a short-term temporary thing. In September, you thought it's going to be 25 basis points, fine-tuning. In October, we revised everything at 75 basis points and not fine-tuning anymore, and not just a tweak, but major hike. That feeds the market sentiment that it's not a temporary thing. You know, the market trusted the, the central bank when the central bank said it's a temporary thing. No, now this belief is not there. It may be temporary, but it will last l longer. It's not a short-term thing. <laughs> and uh, I myself had to give up on that myth that it's a short-term thing. 
And since you, there is no adjustment in the longer part of the curve, the market indicates that the market is at a loss. The market doesn't know whether it's a sh how long term it will be. Some say that there will be logistics uh, issues for the ne entire next year. Bloomberg said that the coordinated action is needed by the governments of G7 or G20 to do something uh, to avoid this uh, uh, issue. Uh, so, despite the fact that, um, well, I mean, I personally like, heard the message uh, from the Bank of Russia about the uh, intakes of 4% uh, by the end of the year, but the market really is not sure that through monetary policies, uh, without resolving all those issues, you would be able to achieve that goal. Now, whatever it takes, uh, if you mean that, uh, then it might uh, cause uh, different things. Sergey, while you are waiting for your turn, uh, perhaps so many of you know that every Friday at uh, 6 p.m. at the uh, clubhouse of venue, we get together in approximately the same composition to discuss uh, the economy and the markets and whatnot. So this is like uh, open to all of you. It's uh, li going live, so please join. Uh, if you take a look at the uh, federal bonds and the uh, market uh, gaps, and uh, this all started uh, in the beginning of this year. I work with invest investment banks, and uh, I talk to traders, and they share their personal views as to why traders uh, who uh, really read all the same information from the Bank of Russia still cannot really predict what is going on in the market. And uh, that really tells you about this misunderstanding of the next steps of the Bank of Russia. That's why the National Bank wants to have some midterm inflation forecasts and uh, uh, other goals, but those can be revised quite easily. I mean, they should not be anchors, and that was uh, the uh, the arguments of the Bank of Russia, so that uh, the market should not perceive those as uh, an anchor and uh, be guided by those. However, it was a way of going through this uh, foggy future. You know, before that, we had the six to seven, uh, five to six percent uh, neutral ranges. Now all those uh, benchmarks are not really uh, felt, and that's why the rates are going up that much. Raising the policy rate uh, last Friday uh, makes trading to um, get ready for the next wave of higher margin. And uh, we do see that the short-term rates of federal bonds is really above the longer-term ones. For the OFZ market, uh, well, it should really uh, somehow get ready for an impact. And the corporate market uh, would also be hit uh, hard. Uh, they don't have much liquidity, and the rates are not adapting too quickly to the decisions of the uh, Bank of Russia. So we are more or less uh, going uh, into the same trouble when the changes uh, uh, may cause another uh, problem in the market or another change. Well, a technical comment there. This is not a statement um, about the policies of uh, the Bank of Russia, but how it should be ideal, rather. In an ideal world, um, we would uh, uh, know the trajectory of the policy rate in the next year. But that's not it. And, uh, the, when analysts uh, would understand the monetary policy, now, but this is a world when the expectations uh, 
More or less, uh, ideally, when you have the weekly information about inflationary expectations or the weekly forecasts, and at that same point, uh, the markets would uh, really uh, adapt uh, their expectations. But before that, there are no changes because uh, actually the markets were waiting for uh, such a release of new information. Well, the Bank of Russia has really no task of surprising anyone. And with uh, anything else equal, we would like to go in line with the trends. Uh, but almost uh, all uh, decisions of the Bank of uh, uh, Russia is a live decision. It is not really set in uh, marble there. There could be like uh, three or four scenarios, and it is, doesn't mean that uh, the Bank of Russia knew something but didn't tell anyone. So this is the result of the discussion, and so there are things that you need to consider. And it all depends on the assessment of the situation by the board. Uh, there could be one opinion or another, but this is based on a consensus, and uh, what we think that analysts uh, do not understand or really kind of like lose from their sights uh, is the the uh, transmission uh, channel of the of monetary policy if you take a look at lending then lo lending is growing quite actively and this uh, lending uh, pulse uh, in the last uh, uh, 12 months, uh, so this is more than 3% of GDP, historically high values, and we do not see any deceleration of the uh, lending rate in the uh, corporate or un uncollateralized uh, consumer loans or mortgages, and this would really support the demand in the economy and uh, uh, Regarding the checks and balances of the demand uh, and uh, supply and the demand shocks, uh, well, I mean, if there's no really any growth in big growth in demand, then there won't be the supply shock. Uh, and um, if the demand is not going to be well above the, the offer, then there won't be any uh, good potential for price growth. By the way, in the last uh, yeah, the demand for salt actually went down. Actually, well, I mean, it was only a growth of 2%. A good example that which shows that uh, the lack of demand on, uh, on a product would not uh, really uh, help uh, produ producers uh, to increase their prices even though their costs may be rising. The FX markets are next, and indeed uh, the determining factor there in the Russian Federation would be the uh, specific setup of the fiscal rule. That's uh, something that may really move the markets quite uh, considerably. And the uh, setup, which has been in place since uh, 2017, proved to be quite efficient. At least the volatility that uh, we uh, had because of the uh, sharp uh, drop in oil prices, uh, that volatility is uh, gone, and that is a positive thing. However, we have a number of things that do not really fit this concept. And perhaps the fiscal rule in its current form may be revised or amended. And one of the challenges there, which we saw evident uh, this year, is the gap between the oil and gas price uh, dynamics. And uh, we do see that this uh, uh, huge growth of gas prices uh, somehow boosts uh, in money terms, uh, the exports of gas and the uh, gas revenue can be uh, sterilized uh, to a, a less extent, to a much less extent than oil revenue. However, for the budget, it doesn't probably, it shouldn't probably matter what would be the commodity that is generating your income, oil or gas. So do you think that this is a factor? Do you think that we need to revise the fiscal rule or oil is something special? 
So maybe Alexander. Uh, well, revising a fiscal rule for that uh, shouldn't probably be feasible. We need really to take a look at the share of uh, gas exports uh, in the total exports uh, of uh, uh, hydrocarbons and what is the share of uh, oil and oil products? Uh, well, that is uh, like in the past. Now everything or much would change. Uh, people are saying of additional 30 to 40 billion US in additional income a year. And the spot prices that we observe uh, are not the prices, are not the average prices uh, that we sell uh, our gas to Europe, uh, which means that the spot prices may be high. However, the FX income uh, may be growing uh, slower uh, and uh, perhaps uh, uh, sometime uh, of those uh, deliveries of Gazprom to Europe of gas would uh, adjust. So it uh, may have some uh, delayed effect uh, if, of course, those gas prices uh, remain. Uh, colleagues, do we have anyone to comment on that additionally? I actually wanted to come to that, uh, but first about gas and then about the effects uh, that you probably wanted to, uh, to discuss. Uh, look, we tried to really assess that impact or influence uh, in different ways, and uh, it might be quite high, given all those uh, factors, and it may support the exchange rate of the ruble. However, the need of a systemic revision of the fiscal rule because of natural gas uh, would be ad hoc in nature. I do not think that this is the right uh, approach uh, to that, uh, well, regardless of gas or not. And uh, if we are going to have uh, a certain uh, construct of the um, fiscal rule, it may be a startup or a machine, you do have all those uh, uh, interesting cases when everything is working well, and then all of a sudden um, there's something that you never expected, and uh, it may change uh, the whole paradigm. Now, if you want to change anything there, then it should not be changed for the sake of gas. Uh, it might be uh, for the sake of all factors. It may be caused by the growing prices of wheat or, or something else that you export. Um, but generally speaking, I think that uh, if you want to take uh, a systemic view, then you probably need to go through your um, exports uh, and uh, think whether you need to have a more generalized uh, fiscal rule to include not only gas now, but uh, any similar cases now. Then me, Mr. Sakov perhaps can comment on that. Yes, Sasha. Uh, some time ago, in your analytical uh, note, you shared some interesting thoughts about uh, the geometry of uh, the fiscal rule uh, and uh, the effects uh, that uh, this fiscal rule may cause. Can we have the presentation from Sasha? Not, not this one. This one we'll see a bit later, the previous one. Alexander Isakov from VTB. Well, guys, I don't really need any slides. Uh, we have this, you know, face-to-face -face, uh, exchange of opinions, but uh, and I wanted to share with you uh, uh, some thoughts of mine uh, about the fiscal rule and tell you a few facts about uh, the way it works so that uh, you can uh, have a better understanding of the fiscal rule, how it is uh, construed today. Well, in principle, all this discussion about the fiscal rule is coming to two statements, uh, more or less, uh, fiscal rule, uh, kind of like uh, decreases the elasticity of oil, and uh, second, uh, these are the attempts uh, of uh, trying to think about the uh, correctness uh, uh, of uh, the chosen oil price, cutoff price. So people are actually thinking more about this uh, cutoff price of oil uh, when they are discussing the fiscal rule. 
Well, I will make my presentation uh, um, accessible to all, but you need to know three th things to understand the fiscal rule operation. First, the uh, uh, base price of gas, uh, even without any relation to the uh, current situation, you have the base price of uh, gas, you have the oil again, gas income, and we all know uh, once you get the uh, base uh, price of uh, oil. You have the budget code, uh, and uh, 2017, it grows by 2% every year. But where do you get the base price of or cutoff uh, price for gas? It's a relation of the cutoff uh, uh, base price of oil to the projected uh, oil price. We would project that, well, we think we know that it is like uh, 40 USD per barrel. The projected one is 80%, and then 0.5, and you multiply 0.5 by uh, the uh, gas gas price in accordance with the formula. So it's a linear relation. Why this is important is that uh, in real life, uh, the um, Ministry of Finance's uh, projection of uh, uh, the oil price or gas price uh, doesn't matter because anything above the cutoff price goes to the uh, well uh, to the uh, national wealth uh, uh, fund. But the oil price uh, plays an important role because it sets the price uh, of gas for next year, and then you really uh, can uh, see. Um, what, at what price uh, the gas will be bought at. Uh, we would say this is a uh, um, margin of error of plus or minus 10 percent. And, uh, and we all know uh, the volatility of prices. It tells you that uh, plus or minus 10 to 15 percent may be equivalent to uh, one month of uh, FX purchases under normal conditions. This is important. and. Uh, uh, and the more generalistic uh, conclusion that we can make is that uh, when we, we know the importance of the projected oil price, and hence we can, as a society, be more serious about the way this price is projected. And uh, now we have the right uh, to tell the Ministry of the Economy, guys, please be more open in your projections. Now you have the... Uh, presentation available for you. Well, um, in any ways. So, a second uh, small piece. We are used to discuss uh, oil in terms of its prices, but the important thing is also volume. We are still inside uh, the oil and gas maneuver. Which means that soon the income and the revenue would be determined by production. But we actually form our effects from exports only. And hence, the relation of exports to total production is very important and double so because how much the Ministry of Finance buys in terms of FX would uh, become less sensitive to the supply of FX. Here, this is the uh, share of uh, the purchase of the excessive uh, uh, FX at the oil price, with, which is, um, there's no story there, like it's uh, two thirds all, all the time. Now, if you take a look at this dependence, uh, in terms of the relation of uh, exports to total uh, production, then this dependence uh, is much more pronounced. And in principle, uh, uh, this is something that we need to take into account, and uh, it brings us to discussing some ideal conditions for the ruble when the external world is growing uh, faster than your concession or, uh, or production, or, or at least uh, when your production is growing uh, much faster than your consumption or exports. And last point, uh, uh, we have the practical answer to what to do with the fiscal rule. But I don't think that we have any ideological answer as to which of the uh, macroeconomic functions uh, that uh, fiscal rule uh, 
performs and what trajectory it would stabilize. Uh, we know what it, uh, what it means in terms of the revenue, but uh, not in terms of what it can do to stabilize something. And uh, uh, when we take a look at the most important uh, parts of the fiscal rule in accordance with the Ministry of Finance as the author, the Ministry of Finance says that the basic uh, elements of the uh, rule would be the uh, cutoff price and the size of the structural balance. Uh, the way we use the surplus uh, is not the most important thing. Importantly is to have the ceiling of uh, spending and uh, what is the balance on top of that, which means that we can talk about the way we save uh, this uh, um, access. Our fiscal rule is asymmetrical. You know that uh, the size of the sales is uh, limited by the previous uh, purchases, and the size of the purchases is not limited at all. And uh, we do know that uh, really because of the dwindling uh, uh, national uh, uh, wealth fund, uh, the purchase may also decelerate. But uh, either we to some extent, uh, limit the accumulation of foreign assets so when we reach a, a certain uh, um, threshold of uh, velocity of accumulation and saving above certain level. You can save something in rubles, and you can do that. And we are going to save something in rubles and buy in the end, invest that in lo to local projects uh, of infrastructure. Thank you. Just as a follow-up, why do we need the fiscal rule? It's a, like a treasury thing. So we have to simulate uh, the uh, banking and economic system under a, a variety of scenarios. And my takeaway would be as follows. Ruble liquidity is stable under any reasonable spectrum of scenarios, except for a, uh, the uh, invasion of aliens or a climate catastrophe. In other cases, it's going to be fine with the ruble liquidity. Now, we had COVID. We had a fiscal rule in place. And what we figured out is that despite this balance, thanks to the fiscal rule, we have an, one moving part, which, which is like cash in circulation. It's not really quite related to uh, the fiscal rule, but nevertheless. And the second surprising thing, we realized that the path of the ruble liquidity may change depending on what's happening in the natural gas market. And it also applies to FX. If the central bank sterilizes excess revenue, then it adds ruble liquidity into the system by compensating an outflow into the uh, National Welfare Fund, and it takes some of the National Wealth Fund and takes some of the liquidity from the system. And that is positive for the FX liquidity, negative for the ruble liquidity. So the change in these two indicators at the projected horizon, which seemed to be, uh, which appeared to be solid thanks to the fiscal rule, is no longer solid. And again, we have such a huge. Uh, spikes and gas prices, and again, it could lead to some instability. So one answer is we need to have a well-calibrated fiscal rule that will allow us to make sure it's all fine. Yes, we do have some cushion in the system, and this is really huge. We still have a lot of buffers, but nevertheless, it's a factor which has uh, so somewhat changed uh, under the new circumstances. Now, on the inefficiency of the fiscal rule, 
take uh, Kazakhstan, for example. The National Fund is the key supplier of FX into the FAST budget system, and the National Fund regularly sells this currency that goes into the gas, oil and gas sector. They can convert FX to, to Tenge, and they help the uh, help the budget with the spending part. So the fiscal policy and this conversion policy, they are out of sync very often. There is a mismatch in demand and supply of FX in the domestic market and Tenge, as you may see. Would not appreciate, and there might be huge fluctuations in Tenge. Because someone has a lot of demand for FX and the central bank doesn't provide it. While in Russia, this check, this barrier, the kind of a, is the uh, oil extraction, as Alexander said. If you have this extra limit, then the stability of the fiscal rule may lead to such frictions or distortions in the economy, and the ruble might face bigger flows related to FX dividends, O for Z to non-residents. This is why having such complex relationship only make our life job more exciting and more difficult. Next year, gas prices will be the key player in the market, and their impact uh, will be heavily debated among uh, our experts. We hope that Gazprom will get an extra 70 billion export revenue, 21 billion for uh, export fees will get into the market, whether it's a lot or not. If it's a one-off, it's a huge amount. But if these are export amounts that are distributed across a year, again, there is no one date, not a single date. It's not a mineral tax. Then, I don't think that the gas price would have a strong effect on the ruble. But on the other hand, high prices for gas mean a weaker euro because they import gas. And I guess the impact on the ruble will go through the euro channel. So the ruble will appreciate. So we might uh, need to discuss it. Uh, later on, I guess it's too early to say that uh, gas will have a strong effect on the ruble. Thank you. Uh, would like to say anything? Yes. In the case of the fiscal rule, let's go back. Why was it set up to smooth out budget spending as part of a new business cycle when all prices go up and down regularly, when the budget doesn't get enough? oil revenues and taxes and duties, it would still have enough money to finance its spending at uh, the necessary level. Uh, in this case, uh, in this sense, the fiscal rule continues to do its job. The side effect of the fiscal rule is that it gives you not impermanent and perfect, but a high security from the so-called Dutch disease, when a windfall of FX due to a rise in oil and gas revenues. So the uh, Ministry of Finance and uh, the Central Bank buys FX, and these offsetting purchases help to keep the nominal and the real effective rate of the Russian ruble almost flat. Yes, we can discuss some of the caveats, but it uh, does its job. Sergey, you mentioned this already. You mean on the floating exchange rate? Right. So, not the fiscal rule, but also the floating rate. Could we put up some of the slides by the central bank? You wanted to uh, put it up first, but uh, here we go again. So, let's look at the volatility of the Russian ruble versus the volatility for oil prices before the floating rate was introduced and after that. 
There are also the fiscal rules somewhere in between. So what you can see is that following an initial period of adaptation of all economic entities to the floating exchange rate, the volatility went down and a similar process could be observed in other countries too when they switched to inflation targeting. Russia is one of the export commodities producer and we needed another fiscal rule in that mix. And if there's high volatility in oil prices and that actually remains, so you never had it before. You didn't have it when you had the controlled uh, you only had a, a pig, basically, or a kind of a range. We had a, um, a floating, like a kind of a, a band for the Russian ruble. And we also look at the volatility of the Russian ruble versus the volatility for oil prices. Again, this is relative uh, volatility of the ruble went down. The floating exchange rate had some more benefits with a less serious effect from the fiscal rule. So actually households uh, changed their behavior. We saw a change in the pattern. Previously households knew that the rule was getting weaker and they saved uh, used dollar assets, they purchased uh, fixed cash, increased their fixed deposits. But right now, their behavior changed. And the fixed balances on the accounts are lower, and the volatility is narrowed. And third, Russian citizens are now country cyclical in their behavior. When the ruble was getting weaker in the past years, our people go to the FX market and buy what? They sell FX. Right now, the ruble has strengthened, and people buy FX. So they act counter in a country cyclical way. And what is important is that it's an extra mechanism to stabilize the Russian ruble, which is outside of the fiscal rule. Now, I'd like to beg to disagree with the, state, the statement that the fiscal rule has an impact on liquidity in the banking system. The liquidity in the banking system is defined by the Bank of Russia as part of its operational model, as part of its monetary policy. We inject, if needed, if there's lower liquidity uh, based on the fiscal rule uh, transactions, and we withdraw excess liquidity, sterilize if there's too much liquidity in the system due to a number of reasons. What can it lead to? Those mismatches in the fiscal rule operations? Well, the structural surplus could vary. There might be a situation of a structural deficit of liquidity, but in terms of the amount of liquidity in the banking system, this amount will all be, be sufficient, and that will be ensured by central bank operations, either absorption or injection. Absorption through deposit operations or through repo transactions. That's it. Fine. Thank you, Pavel, very briefly, because we'll need to finish in with like five minutes. I'm sorry, I, uh, I was referring to structural, structural surplus or deficit, and for research purposes only. So I look at the Treasury figures because the total structural deficit or surplus is interesting in terms of the utilization of uh, collaterals, which are quite a, a safe level. But our banking system also need, also depends on the 
Russian Treasury funds. And again, it also depends on the decomposition of the Russian uh, Treasury funds, uh, securitized, non-securitized, long-term, short-term. It has an impact on the liquidity in the banking system. And you can you do see some trends uh, over the horizon, so it is important. And at the end, I'd like to somehow have a broad view of the current FX exchange rates. Since 2017, we've been into a series of episodes when the central bank responded by changing its FX policy drastically. So for a time, they stopped buying FX. It's not, it has nothing to do with oil prices. It was due to circumstances uh, related to stability and market resilience. Again, we are part of the emerging markets, and that also depended on the risk appetite around the world. And during the pandemic, luckily, the central bank started ethics, not according to the fiscal rule, but it's because they had some money after the sale of the of Sberbank to the MOF, and it's a kind of domestic operation. We still have this ethics that you may sell. If we look at the volatility of the ruble in critical points, uh, at the junction when there's a shock in the market, you just need to distance yourself from the fiscal rule. You need to give it to put it on hold, otherwise it would be difficult to keep the Russian ruble within the range where it was, right? Do you agree with this or not? Maybe it's more appropriate to acknowledge that we don't have the free flow, but still it's a kind of a managed uh, floating regime. And we may, you know, kind of intervene at critical points. On behalf of the Bank of Russia, I may say that the Bank of Russia has never said that uh, it will never hold any uh, FX interventions, and this uh, instrument is still on the table. It's still part of our tool set. So if we are to ensure financial stability, FX intervention are always viewed as one of the tools to maintain stability. However, we have not seen any need to use this instrument. Last year, uh, we indeed had uh, one episode, and you describe it as a, a kind of a deviation from the fiscal rule, but actually we discussed it earlier. It was perfect timing. Well, we knew it before the crisis that we saw later. Uh, there is no correlation. It's not a coincidence. It's a coincidence. The budget rule works with a kind of a momentum, yeah, with a kind of a lag. So you have four prices, then you define the uh, planned amount of purchase, and prices went down. But as part of the fiscal rule, we still had to sell FX, although it was evident then you would have to buy it in a month. And in this case, the Bank of Russia changed uh, the mechanics. And we started to do early warning purchases. Well, you can call it directly FX intervention, but it's not uh, called this way. But you can't say, well, again, FX interventions usually is the purchase of FX to support some level of exchange rate or uh, some level of volatility of the national currency. That's usually the function, you know. So there are no benchmarks for Russia, for the Bank of Russia in this case. So this is why we don't call what we did uh, any FX interventions. Well, there are some elements of it, but still, are you ready to agree or not? But this is not uh, 
the narrow definition of uh, FX interventions. I'm sure we'll go revisit this issue next year when we realize, when we understand all of the uh, investment options for the National Wealth Fund. Will you buy more FX or will you mirror operations? Will it mirror operations to the central bank? That's the, the big question. And again, it will become more relevant next year. The government plans to invest about 12 billion US dollars into Russian infrastructure projects, and it's not going to be a direct injection. It's going to be an issue of some infrastructure bonds through the since the projects will be implemented uh, through the sale, through the purchase of those uh, tools, of those bonds. So we just need to wait and see. We're all very much interested in how it's going to go. Do we need to uh, adjust our uh, FE, our exchange rate projection? Uh, do we need to recalibrate it due to that future use of the FX? There will be some dependency, and I guess uh, the Russian ruble would need to be appreciated. But there's still no debate. We don't know what will be the mirror mechanism of the investments that come from the central bank. So far, we don't have a clear answer. <coughs> well, I can respond to that. You need to proceed from the premise that there will be the same rationale that you saw when we sold uh, the uh, share of spare bag to the government. Uh, what we say is that the National Wealth Fund will be moved uh, from uh, li liquid to invest, uh, investable part. So you need to remove or withdraw some parts that is donated in FX. We need to sell that FX to buy ruble assets and uh, hence uh, selling uh, FX uh, from the uh, National Sovereign uh, Wealth Fund uh, should be somehow balanced uh, by its policies. And uh, just a story for you about the use of the fiscal rule and its modifications and versions. Uh, I have just one point. Uh, so far, it looks uh, in the back mirror as the uh, fiscal rule of the common sense in terms of uh, influencing the FX market. So I am quite relaxed regarding the fiscal rule, though. Now, perhaps uh, the mechanism chosen would be fine-tuned uh, towards, uh, you know, producing the least effects out there. We're not saying, really, that at the moment uh, of investment of uh, the sovereign fund money in the market, uh, you mm, saying that in, in the market so that the volume of purchase as before uh, would uh, really be ex kind of like stretched in time so that we would prevent uh, the effects on the exchange rate of the ruble. Cumulatively, cumulatively there will be some influence on the exchange rate, uh, but it would not mean that at uh, anything equal uh, it would really be that. Uh, there may be other factors uh, that influence uh, money, uh, that influence the exchange rate, sorry, and uh, the uh, operations and behavior of uh, companies, of corporates, households, uh, residents, non-residents, etc. Et Final remark from you? Well, to me, uh, the uh, floating exchange rate uh, of the currency would be its uh, predictability. If it is not floating, you know what it is going to be tomorrow. So we are past that. And um, regarding the episodes of 2018 and 2020 about those uh, pulses, uh, then if we would go back to this uh, uh, moving uh, volatility, then uh, now we would claim uh, that those pauses and pulses uh, were happening at a time when one needed that. It was uh, for the benefit, ind indeed, uh, but we should not really hush up uh, the talks about interventions uh, and uh, 
limitation of the exchange rate volatility because uh, otherwise it is going to be some miscommunication. We, well, I mean, uh, the stance is uh, linked uh, to the exchange rate dynamics. Uh, well, if you take volatility as the synonym of uh, financial stability or, or instability, then you are right. But uh, uh, not all uh, uh, instability would be a danger to financial stability or resilience. And I think that this should be taken on a case-by-case -case basis. Well, thank you very much. Uh, we indeed exceeded our time, but I think it was worth it. Uh, thank you.